On this month's episode of Pedal Box, suspend your disbelief. We're finally putting coilovers in the front of our car. And we're pretty sure we've got a way to mount our steering column as well. But before we spring into action, we're going to take a quick look at the chassis because we've now found out what this actually was. And that means we can take some measurements off what it was before and what it is now and compare the two to just see just how big we've actually made it. It is a big thing. Yeah, it's quite a lot. So we've mentioned a time or two in the past that we're a little bit wider and longer than a regular Caterham, but just to visualize how much that's the case, if we start from a 106 inch wheelbase on our car, I'm just gonna roll this rear wheel forward until it matches the wheelbase of a real Caterham. And that's about it. This is an 88 inch wheelbase originally, which represents a 20% increase on our build. However, that doesn't really tell all of the story. We've increased the width of this car an awful lot at the back, obviously because we have a trans axle and we've got the swing arms that need to fit in, so it's bumped everything out. And we have some quite wide section tyres compared to what you would find on a normal Caterham or kit car style affair. But what that means is we're now nearly 70 inches wide across the back of our car. A normal Caterham or kit car of that type is 53 inches wide. And what that represents is about this much tuck in from the outside edge of where we are to where the normal wheel would sit. Here's a quick look at the sizes of the normal car, an 88 inch wheelbase and a 53 inch track. Comparing that to our donor car however with a 59 inch track from a normal A3. The overhang at the front and rear actually makes it look like an enormous car, although it's still a fairly small hatchback by modern standards. Now stick with it because this isn't what our car is going to look like, it's just a bit of a fudge from the two drawings. Our actual track is 62 inches centre to centre, 9 wider than the normal Caterham 7 style, and we're 106 inches long, which is considerably longer than the normal car. If we take away the A3 drawing from this for a moment, the comparison's a little bit clearer. Although the body is still a fudge, and I'm really not sure what the final design is going to look like, but it gives a good idea for scale. Just as a comparison to the rest of the things we have in the fleet, the original A3 that we took all of these parts from was about a 98 inch wheelbase, which isn't too bad. The Mark II Golf that I've got is about 97 inches, so we're quite a bit longer than that. The SD1 that Chris has is about 109 inches, but that is a four door. The saving grace is that we're still not as long as the Thunderbird, which as a two door car has a 113 inch wheelbase. So we're not quite building a land yacht, but compared to a normal kit car, yeah, we're building a land yacht. Now the plan to do inboard suspension with push rods is on hold for now, just because it's quite a complex thing to do and I'm not really certain of the geometry and how to make it work. So we're going to go for a much more conventional coilover arrangement in here. We're going to attach the bottom of our coilover onto the lower suspension arm with a couple of little brackets, much the same as we've got on our upper arms, and we're going to do the same on the inboard end. Quite boring, quite vanilla, but easy to make and quick to make, which is really important for us right now. For the brackets, we're using 3mm steel because we want these to be fairly strong. We've marked out two and a half inch squares, then cut triangles out of each one. For consistency, we're drilling these out to 12 mil, although the shocks at the moment are mounted for half inch. We'll make sure we get these re-sleeved before we finally mount them. The brackets themselves are being mounted onto the shocks with misalignment washers between them. Now this isn't because we expect any misalignment, but they are tapered so they miss the bushes. If we tighten this immediately up onto the bushes, we'd end up pinching it, changing the rate, and it's going to be very difficult to get them in and out once it's all mounted on the car. We've moved the hub to the lowest point of travel that we expect, because the damper always wants to be extended when at rest and unloaded. This makes it easy for us to position and attach the mounts onto the swing arm and the rest of the chassis. With it in this position, we can accurately see how far along the arm we need to position the lower and the upper mounts to get them into sensible places. Now these ones are going to be welded in directly onto the arm here, and these ones are going to be welded in just behind our front suspension mount for the top arm. Once we've got these top brackets attached, we'll trim these down and neaten them up so they don't quite look like the eyesore they are now. We've got everything quite well together now. We've got the dampers in with no coil springs on them, so then we can extend and compress them really, really easily without resistance. We've got it all loosely bolted into the new brackets. And before we spend all the effort of tidying them up though, we just want to make sure that the range of motion is good. So we're going to lift the body up, 
and make sure that we get as much extension as we need out of the suspension because although it's working well bottomed out here we want to make sure that we can clear some bumps so this is about normal ride height and then that's fully extended and we can see everything is moving as we'd like it to I'm fairly happy with that. Now that we've got our coilovers in the front and the suspension up there is starting to take shape pretty well, I think it's time to move on to steering. So this should be quite good fun. This is the full dashboard mount and cross member out of the A3 that we pulled all this stuff from. And this is the vertical adjustment on the steering column that we'd really like to keep. It also has some in and out adjustment, but I can't, you know, can't do that. Um, now, Adrian and I are very different sized people. Any of you who know us personally will have seen that. And we need to be able to handle the fact that my arms reach this far and his arms reach that far when we're in the car. So we all need to be able to move. So we're going to have to keep a lot of this old bracketry. So we've got a pivot point at the back there. Oh, excuse me. That it rotates around for the vertical. And it actually slides internally in the mechanism here. So we're going to lop all of that off and reuse it and attach it onto our body. The other thing we've got to worry about is this linkage here that goes down onto the steering rack is nowhere near long enough. So we're going to have to have to either extend this or replace it outright. So we've got a little spline drive coming out the back of the steering column there. We can probably pop this off and put a new longer arm on there to get down to our steering rack. We just need to count the number of splines correctly to make sure we get the right one. Now you might think we've got a bit ahead of ourselves here, but we've fitted out an interior. We've got a pile of bricks here to represent the bottom, or roughly where the bottom of the seat will be. We've got a lovely piece of sporty MDF for the footwell, and this fantastically comfortable piece of box section for a back of a seat. But importantly, we can now add a steering wheel onto the car. And that means the comedy moment of me trying to shoehorn my way into this can happen. So, this is roughly where it'll be. It's not too bad of a position, but obviously we need to mount the steering wheel. What we found from testing this though, is we don't actually need to extend our column at all. We can get away with it with a slightly deeper boss if we need to, or a deeper dish wheel, or get around it some way, because the distance that it's out, for me, is within an inch. Chris actually fits in here surprisingly well, albeit his tiny legs put him about here. So we need to chop out a couple of these existing mounts, get rid of these, and probably get rid of this as we planned before, because otherwise our adjustment lever won't work. And that's kind of critical to why we're using this. So we're going to pull out these brackets and probably chop a little bit out of this so we can work out where we need to get to. Another piece, another pile of rust. Now that we've got all that out of the way, we can see where we're going to mount this properly. So we're going to put two brackets off the side of here because this pivot is where the up-down motion of the column comes from. So we'll mount brackets off there, weld them onto this cross member in place of wherever it's gone, the one that I just cut off from here. And then to replace this piece, we're going to build an upright section that comes across and joins onto the top of this section here. So we've got three nice points of contact across there and we're going to cut this bracket down because we really don't need it this high anymore. We haven't got this giant tube. To position the steering column, we clamp this piece of steel down the center line of the car. With an accurate point of reference from, we can align the steering column properly and make sure we don't weld it out of line with where we expect the driver's seat to be. Now that the steering column's kind of aligned mostly, all we've got to do now is get some brackets on, which we've put on here with some magnets. We're going to tack this in place, check the alignment, and then stitch it in proper. Now, the moment of truth, we can see if it starts. It doesn't start. But the steering lock's off now, so we can see that everything else works, which is at least a plus. So we're putting a nice big beefy cross brace in here to support our steering column. That's just going to sit over the top and we're going to weld this bracket up onto it. 
And we've got to do this because the little mounting that we've got at the front, obviously it's quite near the front of all the mech and there's not really a lot of strength in it. It's able to twist quite easily. So we've got these uprights in here that are going to support the crossbar, which we're going to weld in now. Now we've got that tacked in, we can just pop the wheel back on, release the steering lock, and see if anything binds. And it's nice and smooth. That is a success. Now that we've got all this fun stuff working, it's time to protect our metalwork. It's been exposed for quite a while now and it's getting a fair bit of rust forming. So we're going to pull off all of our moving parts and fully prime the whole front end. 